The lecture will be recorded and the recording is starting now. Q&A session in the end will not be recorded. So please, Julian. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and thank you everyone for being here. And uh, I look forward to taking you on a little bit of a whistle stop to our Sakata on some recent, uh, most recent work has been done. So I named it Archaeological Explorations on Sakata. Uh, unfortunately, my colleagues uh, Ishmael and Ahmed are unable to join us. Uh, we did try earlier, but due to uh, the poor internet connectivity on Sakata, things are a bit tricky and we couldn't establish a, a proper connection. Uh, they're here in spurt and they <laughs> thankfully wish me good luck on this. So let's get straight away and started. So. The focus of this lecture is to demonstrate the nature and extent of Scotta's inclusion and isolation in the archaeological record, and just highlight the impact that this has had on the sort of landscape and its inhabitants. Uh, so what we would here yeah, like to do is just take you through some of uh, the highlights of Scotta's archaeological sites and looking specifically at those sites that allow it to be allow us to get a better understanding, uh, not of what we've read in numerous historical accounts, but what the archaeology on the island is showing us. Now, while much work remains to be done in developing a sort of deeper understanding of what's going on during various periods of Sakata's past and present, we are finally moving away from old narratives of an isolate, uh, isolated island that one could magically procure frankincense, dragon's blood, and aloes. And then we start to look at an island that's deeply connected to intercontinental maritime interaction spheres of the Western Indian Ocean. An island where the local population were not just passive recipients, but were active players that had a complex social, religious, political, and economic life. So what I have to do here is normally show you where Scotta is. In the past, I probably could have skipped this section. And while today scholars often ignore or admit Scotta entirely from their maps, uh, this situation is quite different in the past. Now, obviously, the first one I'd like to show you here is this big yellow map that you see. It's, called, it's uh, Muhammad al-Idrisi's Book of Roger. It was drawn up in 1154, and the circle that you see there, that is Sakata on a world map. It just gives you an idea of the importance of Sakata within this uh, Islamic sphere, and it just shows you that even Sakata in this world map was highlighted a lot bigger than technically it, it is in reality. Uh, and the same goes in this navigational map of the Gujarati sailors here in the 17th century. And what again this map shows is it's showing how the islands are utilized uh, as sort of entranceways into the Red Sea. And we'll get back to this because, you know, the island of Sakata is actually part of the Red Sea. And while I won't go deep, delve deep, too deeply into how we consider the limits of the Red Sea in the past rather than today, Scotta would be in the Gulf of Aden. It's just worth bearing in mind that the islands were considered as part of entering the Red Sea, a big part of it. And this is only illustrated here in one map, but I have others that I can show you. Uh, and while these maps are great, uh, we should probably not forget the written accounts. And we have many. We have Argathesius, Diodius, Pliny, Ptolemy, an unknown author of the first uh, mid-first century, Periplus, Marius, Elfrea, and even accounts by Cosmos in the Complices, Al Hamdani, Al Masudi, Ibn Al Mujawa, Ibn Battuta, Marco Polo, Nicola de Conti, and many, many others. And all of these people have been instrumental in our understanding of Sakata and its place within the Western Indian Ocean. Indeed, within these accounts, we learn much about the people, uh, much about the island itself. We know that the north coast apparently was inhabited by Greek, Indian, and Arabian trader, traders. And we also know that it was ruled over by the mainland of Yemen. And of course, we all know throughout the period that Sakata was an important supplier of frankincense, dragons, blood, and aloes. And this gets repeatedly mentioned throughout the historical sources. However, 
we actually learned very little about the local population up until the medieval period, when we, they are said to be Christians who practice sorcery. And we have this sort of theme that continues as Christians who are sorcerers able to influence the weather and make clouds appear and disappear. And it's one of the idea of the Christians there comes into the post medieval period. And it's one of the reasons, of, one of many reasons, the Portuguese attempt to establish a garrison on the island. The other reason, of course, was it geostrategically, Sakata is vitally important even today, as it sort of controls all traffic coming into and out of the Red Sea. Um, just looking at some previous archaeological work, and I love this quote by Bent here. Um, as you, you may guess, earlier archaeological studies of Sakata have been highly influenced by the historical record, and which actually provided the main impetus for early expeditions undertaken. And these the primary aims of theirs were to unearth evidence for the presence of this foreign population that was said to be residing on the north coast. And this is clearly seen in where these excavations and where these surveys were focused on. And we have Bent here in 1889 visited the island. And sadly, it was the uh, it's where he contracted malaria. And in Doe, who visited in the 1950s and 60s, and Shuni as well in the 1960s. And again, uh, we have Naukin and uh, Sedov, Alexander Sedov, who in the 1980s also visited the island. And again, most of these were all aiming to investigate, do we have this purpose? Where are these people? Not where are the people of Sagata, always where are the people, these foreign traders? So when we look at Shuni and Doe, um, you can see from this, <laughs> I love this quote out of Shinny. the results of the survey were not spectacular. Uh, and it clearly, you know, he didn't find what he wanted to, uh, but he did find many, many sites that were of relative historical importance. Uh, though as well, they found things and they talk about miles of far walls and farm stretch, farmsteads stretching across the island. And they talk about various uh, earlier medieval sites. And one of the things that Doe mentions is that because of a lack of important buildings, define important building, I guess, or significant artifacts, again, these people are probably working in Yemen, so I guess significant artifacts apart at that point may not have been that significant at the time. Nevertheless, uh, they said, well, look, there's nothing here. It's basically a series of uh, rock structures and not many artifacts. So these guys who were living on the island, the local population, were clearly carpet farmers who tended trees and collected resins for the Hadrima kingdom. And many people were brought over during this collection phase to, to collect the resins and then disappeared. So when this trade is sometime, I guess, in the fourth century, the trade incense sort of collapsed or uh, reduced down to a thing, he believes that these people all became herders and fishermen, like the herders and fishermen he met on the island during his uh, during his excavations and surveys. So we we'll turn to the Naukan and Sedov um, in the 1980s, and they were a bit more fortunate. They covered less of the island. And they located and excavated on a large township on the north coast where they found a series of surface finds. And I, I just hesitate on that surface finds, which included fragments of a massive Roman amphora handle and fine red lacquer caps, lacquer cups and bowls, believed to the latest similar finds in the Mediterranean. Now, Again, these were surface finds, so we, I'll go return to the site at some point, but it's just bear that in mind because from the findings that made at the site and the structure of the site, they believe that the site is uh, dated to somewhere around the first century CE, and it continued later down into the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, and this is based as well on some extra burials on the end, but we'll get to that again later. In addition, they also went through the island and they identified flint tools believed to be Neolithic and excavated several burials, and some of which they dated to the uh, 840 to the 1160 
CE and investigated several cave burials uh, dated to around 650 CE. And again, based on these results from his work and some of the anthropological work that he did on the island, he proposed that instead of this cooperative farmers that the island was populated by a cohesive original culture with an autochthonous base, a yeah, local population doing there. Then we move on again to Weeks as I who visited the island, Lloyd Weeks and his team in 2000. And they undertook a survey, and this sort of focused more on the interior and southern half of the Sakata, where a few sites, as you can imagine, were recorded. And yeah, this was rather a rapid survey, and thank you, Lloyd, for all, all your uh, data that you helped to uh, provide me. Uh, and again, you know, they recorded a number of structures and graves, um, and it was great, but the important thing is, yeah, there's a southern half of Sakata, originally believed to be uninhabited, they found several settlements, um, but the exact length of time these settlements is, uh, were established uh, and any other sort of more related to that, <laughs> we have no dates. So it's useful to know that we have sites there, but again, this is a, a theme that will come up throughout, is very few dates in Sakata. Then a bit later, uh, after some... Uh, work that we did originally, um, myself and my colleagues, Kristen Hopper and Dirk van Dort, we ended up uh, utilizing satellite imagery and recording these walls and farmsteads on Sakata. And over the time, approximately 4,460 kilometers spread of walls throughout the entire island, as can be seen here. Indeed, there may be more walls, but due to the satellite coverage or the fact that they there's a bit of development going on. A lot of these walls may have also been uh, moved on. And what's interesting just quickly here is on, you see on the uh, East Coast, on uh, Maumee Plateau, this very dense concentration of walls. And it's perhaps unsurprising that in this dense uh, concentration of walls, there's frankincense trees. And there were a lot more frankincense trees based on um, botanical studies, but it's clear that this area was quite rich in uh, frankincense trees, and it's quite likely that these walls may relate to that. What we also um, tried to establish with is that a lot of these walls seem a bit strange, and it was, wait a minute, they're not all just partially off pieces of land, but they're also looking at soil and water management. And so what we see here in the bottom corner, you see some settlements in that that are sort of somehow linked. And not only a bathroom, but form part of these walls. And some of these walls uh, would be leading to what we call uh, leams or dams on Sakata, and it's channeling water to dams, or they were at, uh, a part of like enclosures where one can imagine that you would collect the resin, allow us to bring it into an enclosure before you traveled further. Because these are the highlands, and it's quite difficult to get down to the coast from these areas. It involves a few days worth of walking in some instances. Uh, obviously not today, there's roads, but uh, yeah, in the past. And then came probably one of the most spectacular discoveries that was made on Sakata. And uh, this was made during the Sakata Cross project, led by Peter de Geest, and his team discovered the now very well-known Hock Cave, where we have a corpus of nearly 250 texts and drawings from the 1st century BC uh, to the 6th century, uh, uh, sorry, 1st century CE to the uh, 6th century BCE. And while most of these scripts are in Indian Brahmi, there are also scripts in South Arabian, Ethiopian, Greek, Palmarian, and Bactrian. And also we have finds of a pottery within the cave and a wooden tablet with a Palmarian script dated to the third century by a person called Abgar, who was visiting a cave, uh, the cave, and was written on this thing. He's praying to a deity, uh, as sort of a religious uh, religious sanctuary for maritime peoples. And 
thanks for us. He's actually dated his thing, and it's dated to the 25th of July, 258, which is very helpful. One of the things that we do find, however, in the cave, interestingly enough, there's no indication that local population entered these caves. There's no evidence of any local interaction in these caves. And it was often said that due to ethn ethnographic accounts, that the Sakata have an aversion to entering caves due to the uh, mythical big white snake that lives in this cave and that uh, eats people who get venture too deep in the cave. But as we'll soon see, this is quite far from the truth. So then in 2017 and 2019, we started the Sakata Heritage uh, Project, and it's a group of Sakata women and men who undertook a comprehensive survey of Sakata that by the end of the project in 2019 recorded over 410 sites, including the visiting those recorded by previous expeditions. A corpus of data that has highlighted the rich archaeological heritage of Sakata and the outlying islands of Samaha and Dasa. As such, now when we look at the archaeological heritage sites on Sakata, we are confronted with this. Well, again, as I will say, much work remains to be done on Scott is far richer in archaeological sites than has been previously before. But again, what about this? And how do these findings help us better understand the complex social, religious, political, and economic lives of the Sakatu people? Up to this end, we need to look at some of the finds that have been made during the survey, beginning with the rock art that is provided with it as with an insight into many aspects of the social, religious, political, and economic lives of the Sakatu people. And it's something that has been quite interesting to myself in. And the first of these projects was the Hasi Cave. And the Hasi Cave is situated in the eastern interior of the, uh, of the island. And it's really very unclear as to where this cave is. You really have to almost walk on top of the entrance to find it. And it's thankfully we had our local guides who pointed us to this cave and said, okay, you know, you're welcome to go in there, but you know, we were not going to come in. And eventually by the end of the project, they ventured slightly further into the cave to sort of see what we would keep going in there and spending eight hours or nine, 10 hours a, a day in this cave. And, uh, you know, what we found was just, just this plethora of these uh, inscriptions, well, not sort of inscriptions, but yes, more just uh, markings in the cave. And uh, these are all centered around what's in the foreground, you can't see, a sort of water-filled sump. And what is interesting, I have a based, we weren't able to get some dates from this, um, and we had to bring in uh, near-infrared uh, cameras because some of the uh, artwork is not visible. It's, it's You have to use near-infrared, and it, it sort of highlights the walls of the cave, and all of a sudden, these images pop out at you and you just see this plethora of, you know, of markings on the cave. And at first it just looks like some scribbles. And then when you start to look at a bit clearer, you can actually identify sort of points and areas where there's specific bits in the cave that make sense. And based on sort of the imagery, I sort of provisionally dated it to somewhere around the first century BCE to about the 15th century. Now, let me explain why. As I discussed earlier with the with the walls, we saw these squiggles here, as you can see. And at first, we're like, ah, oh, goodness, what could that be? And then we're sitting outside the cave in one evening, or just as the sun's about to set, looking out on the uh, landscape. And I was like, you see those walls there? Don't they look familiar? And these walls, cross said, oh, yes, actually, they do. And I was like, well, we should go back in the cave. So we went quickly back into the cave and we looked at the these inscriptions and we came back out and we said to so actually you no, know, it's quite likely that this is it may be something. So we tried to map a little bit of the walls in the short time allowed. And some of it did relate to some of these uh what you might want to call squiggles. And it on that premise, and it's a hypothesis, of course, we believe that these cave had actually been some sort of meeting point, and you could almost envision people trying to separate 
a division of areas and sort of this is my area or this is all and trying to work this out within the cave it seems a bit strange but it's all related again to how of the land control and mentioning this and why i say that again because when we look at this sort of religious uh, imagery here we see this sort of syncretism now it has also been uh, mentioned earlier we see this animistic uh, horned man as you might see there in the picture we have uh, several Christian or Ethiopic crosses, and we have an Islamic inscription. And finally, we also have some ships. Now, it seems a bit strange that you're nowhere near the sea here, but you have ships. And it's just an imagery of potentially something that was obviously important to these people, you know, shipping brought goods, and they could sell. And today, well, more in the past, when shipping arrived, they would go down to the coast to sell the ghee or to sell the frankincense or what it is. But these ships played an important part of their lives. So part of this idea of the Hasi Cave is that it's sort of like a nodal point within the landscape, not only to show the, the walling and everything outside it, but also a sort of a meeting place. And another aspect of this is because we have water, this big water filled sump that even during dry years never goes away. And it's a source of water if you dare venture into the cave, which clearly they did. Uh, and there's a source of water. And it's it's just to remember that aridity on Scotland, especially during the, monsoon, the dry monsoon periods where rains fail, you know, people, there, were, there was a count of uh, many thousands of people being, that well, the island being decimated of its population of goats and people because there's not enough water. So we'll just move on to the next site. Uh, so this is probably one of the uh, largest and most well-known sites on Skata, Eriosh. Uh, besides the fact that it's so well-known, it remains relative, it remains basically undocumented there's about four or five accounts that have some uh, quite quick sketches of the rock art here uh thank goodness um we have an alif project starting shortly which will uh, provide the means for the Sukatu team to go out and fully record the site so that we can actually get a, a good example and know exactly what's on the site and try to implement some protection measures um I'll quickly delve into why, because what you can't see behind you is a road. And they diverted the road to stop it going through a natural heritage site because it was going to go too close to a lagoon. And they diverted over part of the site. So we've probably lost a tenth of the site on the one side because someone decided that they'll divide the road across the site. Great stuff. Well done. Um, still moving on. So again, what we can see here on um, Erosh, the few things that we have been able to pick up. Again, we see this sort of uh, image there of the horned man. We also have a series of crosses. We have some feet, which are not pictured here, with crosses in the front. We have a picture of a camel. Why a camel? We don't know. Camels don't occur naturally in Sagato. The first camels were probably brought in late medieval period if that it's there were no camels and it's there aren't that many camels on the island still um again we we're seeing this sort of syncret the uh, animistic uh christian uh there's no islamic scripts here but we're seeing this other script here which i'll just hold that just bear in mind there's that inscription and um there's a lot of this type of inscription. It has once been recorded, at least in areas that it occurs. But when we go to the next site in SHP 067, I apologize, it's been given this name because the actual Sakatu name for the site means flat rock. And there's a lot of flat rock on Sakata. So it's a bit tricky. I mean, we try to find a way. We didn't want to just give it a, another name. We wanted to use a Sakati name, but we tried to explain to people the Sakati name. First of all, I'm struggling to say it at the moment, but also uh, there's a lot of flat rocks. It's a bit difficult to say, could you go to that flat rock, please? Uh, and we call it SHP067 for now. And at SHP067, we have this script, and it occurs also on Eros, as you've seen, and there's got parallels of this script in Dofar. So this script is known to be related to a family of South Semitic scripts. But unfortunately for us, the script has not been dated or deciphered yet. 
Uh, so we're still uh, we're a bit stuck again, but it's nice to know. So if any of you people out there are linguists, please, and you feel like a little puzzle, we have the script and it's ready. We have better imagery than this. But what's important for SHP 067 is this, again, this Christian imagery, as you can see here, as you saw in Dahasi. And, you know, we believe it could date to around somewhere in the 4th, 5th century, where it's believed that uh, Christianity came to the island. Although on SHP 067, we also have imagery of shipping, and we have the, the very sort of... Um, other imagery that could be related to a Portuguese occupation and, and the other vessels and things. So it's a bit of a tricky site to decipher. Uh, we've done several uh, passes at the site. And like I say, thank goodness, but you'll be happy to know we saved again this site from development. Uh, it was going to become a house uh, until the Sakata Heritage Project, the governor of Sakata and um, Goham all got together and we protected the site, put on the land registry, and now it's there. We have an interpretation board. So next time you're on Sagata, please ask your guide, can I see SHP 067? And it's a very impressive site. Uh, so we'll quickly move on to my next site, which is the Sebrejo. And the Sebrejo, what makes the Sebrejo quite special? It represents the first lockout that's ever been recorded on the south coast an area that has generally been regarded as unpopulated up until the recent past. And at the Cerebro, it's a very strange place. It's extremely dry. There's very little water, even during the wet season. So it's why are people coming here? And part of this, we feel it could be related when we start looking at the imagery here. And what we have, first of all, are these arms. So it's, uh, as you see, it's, uh, his arms are upraised with a circle, and it's been interpreted in the past, these uh, arms, that it's some sort of astral object, such as the moon. And as we know, the worshipping of astral deities goes back to pre-Islamic times. And on Scott, the worshipping uh, of the moon by inhabitants has been recorded throughout its history, even in... Um, Relatively recent times, uh, there's been records, ethnographic accounts of uh, worshipping the moon. So it's quite likely it, it belongs to something along these lines. But what's particularly important is that there's a complete lack of any crosses or other types of Christian imagery at this site. And I believe that this would sort of show that at some point during the 4th or 5th century, when there was a shift in these shared ideological beliefs and this Christianity uh, arrives at the island, it could mean that the inhabitants of the south, which again is very, uh, is very away, it's very difficult to get to, it's not normal, it would have just meant that inha the inhabitants of the south sort of did not adopt Christianity. Or it could have been that they abandoned the site before the arrival of Christianity in the 4th to 5th century AD. Um, again, like I said before, we have many uh, feet on this, and there's most of them are pointed in a specific direction, and it sort of gave me an indication that it could be some sort of procession, yeah, processional pathway through the island pointing in a direction. And when you look at the majority of feet facing in a specific way, uh, most of them sort of point up towards the where you see the gentleman standing there, off to the right, up the hill. And if you go towards that area, there are, there is a, a, a sort of waterfall or something along those lines, which only during the wet season occurs, and there is water around the area. It's not frequent, but we believe it could be related to that. Failing that, that is one of the pathways up through this uh, cliff onto the interior. And within the interior, as we'll see shortly, there's a, a huge amount of settlements in this area and that. They could again be related to something along processual pathways. So I put all this together, sort of give you a brief summary here, and um, it just shows the main sites on Sagata and sort of the date range that we're looking from first century BCE through to the 16th century CE. Um, and I just thought I'd put out generally what we know about these sites. Uh, and again, I'll uh, admit here, like in Erias, where we see 63 is about the quantity that's sort of been recorded in various ways. Again, 
it's the largest rock uh, petroglyph site uh, on Sagata. So there's a lot more than just what you see here. There's literally a handful. As you can see, it's 10,000 um, 10, square meters. Again, uh, on SHP, we recorded over 187 petroglyphs. And again, in Decebro, 51. We still believe that in Decebro, because of the wind and that, we may be able to record several other um, uh, petroglyph sites. Again, it's quite a, a tricky place to work in. It's very remote even today, and it's not the easiest place to get to, let alone work at. So at some point, we may return there and try to further document the site. However, Sakata is not all about rock art. Uh, the Sakata team has also been recording a range of other sites. And these are other sites I'd just like to delve into quickly and, and to sort of highlight uh, in the next stage of this talk, sort of the rich burial archaeology of Sakata. Um, and just sort of highlight some of the funerary monuments that have been recorded and just try and uh, compare and contextualize these traditions with others recorded in the Arabian Peninsula. So the first of uh, these funerary monuments I'd like to show you are the dolmen and dolmen-like structures that occur within the interior. Uh, this one, and there's several others on, a, on another part of the interior. And these have parallels with the mainland Yemen. And according to the mainland Yemen, where they have been dated, they date to around the middle of the fifth millennia BC. So, uh, it gives us sort of some indication of what they could be dated to. We have this. It may look like a chair surrounded by ring of stones, but it's another dolmen type structure that's been robbed of its building materials. And despite this, it is possible to draw parallels with a similar dolmen like structure found at Al Kurias in Yemen, although no dates of this have been uh, obtained so far. And we'll just move on to the next one, which is this. So we have, uh, they have been called boat or ellipse, ellipse graves, and similarities have been drawn with uh, Oman uh, and other areas. And it's a bit tricky to actually say uh, it's not certain as when the dates for these occur. And they're very similar ones. Again, this is in the interior. And as you can see in the background there, we have some uh, some of the wall structures. We have some early and later uh, settlements in the background. So it's a rich landscape. Again, uh, we just move on to the coast. We only find a different type of structure. It's not found in the interior. It's sort of a quadri quadrangle structure, sort of a series of small ashlar stones that you can see form a, a wing foundation. And within this is a row of upright ashes is erected. And again, as you can see, many of it's collapsed. It forms a structure that's very similar to what's found in Wadi Zah in Yemen. Uh, and again, like I mentioned, doesn't occur in the interior. So it could be an indication of a, a cultural difference between the coastal interior populations. And this is similar to today. The coastal population is very different was quite different to the interior population. And it just, as you can see, uh, parts of the structure falling down, but sadly there are several other of these structures. Uh, and unfortunately we are suffering quite a lot from looting for building material. And quite often if you go into a house, you'll see a lintel that was once part of one of these burial structures. Um, so I'd like to just move on again uh, and look at the next structure. And this is again occurs throughout the island. Um, and these cyst burials, which the sort of two types have been documented. And this one is the extant structure. And there are others that are subterranean. Uh, and this burial, while it was not excavated, was looted. And at one point was partially refilled to prevent goats falling into it. So the interior image that you can see here is actually, it was a lot deeper than that, but they they were worried their goats would get stuck in the gray, so they filled it up. And again, this type of uh, chest burial um, has parallels to Wadi Darib in Yemen, and it has parallels to similar things in Oman, and it's been dated to around the late second, early first millennia BC. Um, 
I return to sort of the more uh, subterranean cyst type burials. And, you know, these, these go throughout the island. You have this type and you have another type which you do not see from the surface and uh, is sort of a chance encounter or if it rains heavily. You have a wash and you see some of it protruding out of a mound. Uh, and it's very similar to these ones. Uh, and like I say, again, there are many parallels one can draw from Yemen and Oman. But the dates of this are much more varied, and it's quite difficult to actually place this within a specific date without uh, actually excavating the site and dating it. So it could extend right into the Islamic period. And again, as I mentioned, we have a big problem, I guess, everywhere. We have a lot of looting, which sometimes helps us to find these sites or at least identify where they are. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, especially on the Mormon Plateau, where people have been identified a washed out barrier and then dug in the area and found these burials. Uh, and sometimes they will let you know they found it, and sometimes it's just a matter of luck. And one of these matters of luck turned out to be this, and this was down on the coast again. And they were digging a, a hole for a well, and uh, they came across this burial where the big yellow bucket is. And they said inside there, there's a lot of human remains, which were summary cleaned out. And uh, the, it was set up to uh, make the well. And then they were going to re repurpose the grave, or I wasn't quite sure what. Uh, as you can see, a lot of the sort of findings are fortuitous, and especially these subterranean type uh, cis burials, it, there are no ways unless you use GPR something to actually find these things. Uh, and again, it's very um, just one of the aspects of looting and uh, development that goes on on the island that makes it quite difficult for us to uh, catch up with what's going on. Okay. Um, now just move on to Islamic funeral monuments. Uh, I see these tombs of saints is based on an influx of uh, Hadrami immigrants, uh, many of who were Saeeds, who brought the sort of saint worshipping practices with them. And this particularly, particular Hadrami form of religious practice became a sort of dominant motif of religious expression on the island, although again, it was limited to the northern coastal region. And we have several of these also on the island. Uh, but otherwise, we have these sub rectangular or elongated oval fences, uh, graves. And quite often, you have uh, two or three vertical dug in stones. And in some areas, they've been carved into various shapes. And at first, there was, uh, I believe, Namkin believed that they had some anthropomorphic shape. And others said, no, they had some sort of Christian shape. And eventually we managed to speak to some people who say, yes, but my uncle's uh, buried there. And no, this is uh, these shapes, as you see here, are something that we had in the past. And we just continued this tradition. It doesn't have anything to do with the Christianity. doesn't have anything to do with being an anthropomorphic shape. It's simply an expression, uh, much like today, where you would maybe uh, fashion your gravestone in a particular way. In this uh, community, they... They kept a tradition alive and it's fashioned in these ways. Um, so we'll just move on to another uh, type of Islamic grave or uh, that. And again, it just brings me to one of these uh, points, especially with Namkin and Sedov, where they go on about uh, is an Islamic or pre Islamic grave, uh, which is a sort of a bit of a catch or if you want to say, because Islamic, pre-Islamic, well, pre-Islamic would be Christian, and that was about the 4th, 5th century, and it continued much later into, even it's recorded historically, into the 16th century, and then Islam was there, it was sort of two religions living side by side, there was a mixture, certainly, of both, there's uh, sort of this syncretism that's occurring, uh, and of course, as it develops later, sort of Islamic becomes more and more the dominant religion, uh, but in the burial practices, it's difficult just to sort of cut and say, this, from this point on, we, these are all going to be Islamic type burials, especially since uh, it's not, it's very unclear. And also when we have uh, some of these rectangular tombs, 
And much like the ones I mentioned before, the first century uh, BCE site, uh, Al Hajra, there is actually a lot of graves next to it. And some of these graves are uh, pre Islamic, if you want to call it that. And they've been later carbon dated to around 1230, 140 BP, which sort of gives them uh, an earlier Basid date. Uh, so it's a bit tricky to actually define what they mean by pre-Islamic or Islamic burials and how this relates to the burial traditions in Sakata. And based on this, it was while trying to understand a bit more of what was going on in these burial traditions and that I thought, well, uh, we'll just quickly pass over the uh, Sakata mosques because uh, what you see here was... Uh, one of the early mosques on Sakata, unfortunately, as you can see, a big portion of it was uh, repurposed and uh, modernized. The actual, what the remains of the mosque, uh, unfortunately, has also been modernized. And um, the inside roof of this mosque had uh, beautiful plates and ceramics embedded into the, uh, into the roof of the mosque. And these have been removed and or coated over with a uh, noor, a uh, sort of uh, plaster type thing. So it's a bit tricky, but we were very fortunate to come across Al Ala Mosque. And this mosque had been in use for a while before the roof eventually collapsed. And as you, what you can see here is a renovated mosque that uh, we were working on with the World Monument Fund, funded by Alif. And it's a sort of first stage of the mosque. And what's interesting is, yes, it's one of the oldest mosques on Sakata, and of course, that's extremely interesting. But another thing that's another aspect of this is you see this big pool here, this ablutions pool, and in the background, you'll see there's two uh, rooms where you can do your ablutions, and there's water that's piped into the room. The thing is, it's quite unique, as in the water systems that are coming into this mosque are taken from a well that's situated relatively uh, nearby, a couple of hundred meters. And the, the, the hills in the background that you can see in this picture, and they've channeled the water system comes from the hills and it's channeled through a system of, um, well, I would say channels that are coated with lime and are brought through. And now part of it's obviously put, uh, put plastic pipes in to modernize it a bit. But at present, we don't know much about how the water managed to end up in the mosque, because clearly you need a lot of water in a mosque. And on Scotland, there's not a lot of water. It may look green in places, but it's quite an arid island. So it's, it's another little uh, conundrum. And it's quite interesting because trying to find parallels of uh, where water is coming to or going from is very tricky because not many people actually mention where water is coming from in a mask. There, there's water there, yes. Or do we turn on a tap or how, where's it coming from, especially in the early period? So it'll be very interesting um, to see where we go with Alala Mask. I believe the next stage will be putting a roof on the mask and uh, mapping out and uh, repairing the uh, water system. But let me not digress, we're running out of time as usual. So a recent project of mine was looking at uh, these cave burial traditions. And um, it's a little known or recorded Islamic burial tradition, which has sort of only three other known examples. And there's one in Palestine, which um, an ethnographic study, which sort of placement of the bodies, it shows how they're placed, the walling of the cave, and within this, the caves were separated by gender. The second example of this sort of cave type burials is sort of a personal observation by a archaeologist, Warwick Ball, and he's recorded by uh, Simpson. And it simply states that in the ninth century, early Islamic graves of Sadaq were of the same practice recorded by the same lady, uh, Grandquist, of, who recorded these burials in Palestine. That is, the villagers used caves as tombs, and there was careful avoidance of those caves that contained under undercomposed bodies, and that old burials were simply swept aside before new internment was placed. And the third and last example is the so-called cave of the daughter of Jacob in Safar in Palestine, 
I was a call about Peterson, who mentions a five late uh, Mamluk, 15th to 16th century grave set in the floor of the cave and marked by cenotaphs, and a series of rock cut burial niches that cut the walls of the caves. Um, however, when we looked at the caves in Sakata, it was quite different. Now, while this we are currently publishing the results, and it's also we took uh, some ADNA samples and uh, uh, C14 samples of the case, we're actually coming across quite a different uh, series. Again, there's quite a uniqueness in this burial tradition, and it's got a much broader chronological range than we had previously thought. So we would pass through a on Scotta in a Christian phase and an Islamic phase, and it just shows a sort of continuity of um, burial. It's also changing our widely held beliefs uh, concerning gender segregation stuff. And while I don't want to go too much into detail on this, um, as the results are soon to be published, um, you know, it, it's certainly showing a big change in what we believed uh, was going on with these Islamic caravels and Sakata generally. The final uh, thing I'd like to look at here is the uh, Islamic Sport Project that we're running. The first season was finished uh, last year, and that was looking uh, in March and April in conjunction with Goem Yemen and the Scotto Heritage Project. And we looked at the Jebel Hawari Fort, which is recently it's just about to be published. And on this fort, uh, it was originally believed to have a Portuguese element on it. And it was, in fact, a lot of people said it was Portuguese. So after we cleared it and did a short excavation in one of the cisterns there, uh, we identified uh, four chronological and architectural phases. And they all appear to be related to the Al Mahra station, Don Sakata, and not with the Portuguese. So while further work is still ongoing with the Islamic Fortification Project in Zakata, it does give us a sort of unique look. And we have another um, fieldwork session next year where we'll look deeper into the um, into the island at another fort that was set up. Um, but I just like quickly go over the phasing of this one. So the first phase is this building of a rectilinear structure you can see. Yeah, that big square building on the highest point there, that's our first phase, some sort of watchtower. They could look over the sea. If you look to your right, you would see behind the mountains, behind me is a uh, the sea, it's Sook, with one of the older harbors mentioned in historical accounts in Islamic and earlier. And this would obviously have provided a, an early warning system to anyone uh, on, the, on the island, you know, someone's coming in. The second stage involves a sort of perimetal wall with two semicircular bastions. One of them you can see in the foreground here, um, and a water system. Now, that would be the first system that you can see being excavated here. And uh, from that um, system was probably the most interesting and the most obvious. But as we went into the fourth phase, uh, it's sort of what we would call the abandonment phase, we started digging just further up from that system we found a second system now clearly what happened or what seems to be happening is that the fortress was being occupied by even more people and required even more water to be brought up you're on top of a mountain there's no ways to find water here it has to either be rainwater good luck or you have to walk down to the wadi down the bottom and if it's got some water you'd be lucky to get that and then you'd have to walk all the way up and as my colleagues will uh so as well, it, walking up and down this mountain, they surely we all shed a few pounds. It was quite difficult. Um, unfortunately, again, part of the site was looted. There weren't great many finds with uh, with, uh, with regards to pots in that. And like I say, there's still some work ongoing. The C14 dating is coming. Uh, oops, yeah, here yeah, we can see it a bit more clear. Islamic one, we're calling it two is the exit, three is the Persian to wall, and the four is the other parts of it. But I'll flick through that, you can see that elsewhere. And we can also look at other sites, these sort of Rabat or hill fort, if you want to, sort of overlooking points. Now, it may just appear to be a pile, of, but it overlooks an area of the sea, and we have a few of these recorded along the coastline. And sort of early warning systems again, 
uh, you know, at one point, especially during medieval periods, Gotu was quite often raided. Uh, we have many historical accounts of people laying waste to the islands. So as soon as you would see someone, you could tell people were coming and they would all run to the hills. And even as the Portuguese found, as soon as people arrived, they all ran to the hills and, you know, good luck. And there wasn't much water to be had and very little food to be had on the coastline if they weren't help. So I can quickly run through some of the settlements here within the main island on the interior. We have a very large settlement. Um, I would say it's, it's over two kilometers. It's extremely large. It encompasses some walls. Again, uh, no excavations. We know it's there. We know it, it's general size and how many rooms it contains. But it's very unclear as to what exactly was going on in the settlement. Um, again, as you can see here, there's uh, some of the, a bit more of an early wall in the background. Again, another big settlement that continues and part of the settlement relates to here to your right is a area of uh, uh, temple water. And if you dig there, you may find other water, but it's all related and it's difficult to sort of tease apart these settlements in Sagata because quite often they're reused in modern housing as well. And it's sometimes they're also reused for animal housing, animal enclosures. It makes life a bit interesting unless you can actually put a hole in the ground and find some dating. Um, just to give you an overview of what you can see, um, it's very useful taking a nice uh, overview and looking out of this. You can see on satellite mission that it comes very clear when you uh, look a bit closer using a drone. And you can actually see the, these walls stretching across and sort of very weird patterning, but you can see these sort of enclosures all over. And how this relates to the, the broader scale of uh, frankincense and how it's been ma made and worked, but also aloes and other uh, items of trade that uh, people don't actually think about, but were at one point, I believe it was a few tons of aloes were being exported during the 19th century off Sakata and even mentioned in the Egyptian accounts of um, uh, of mummification, Sakata Ella was highly prized. So it's quite interesting to try and tease these apart. Again, uh, archaeology occurs everywhere, and this is up in the mountain areas of Sakata. We have these big uh, structures here. Uh, nowadays, of course, they're repurposed uh, goat pens or even families will move into these. Uh, originally, they lived some elsewhere. Um, but, you know, again, it occurs everywhere. It's very difficult to ascertain exactly what the settlement was used for, why it was used. Um, work in progress. So just a quick conclusion, I suppose. Uh, hopefully, I've demonstrated the richness of, of uh, Sagata archaeologically historically we're quite aware of it it's very clearly written all over and again just sort of a regional interregional integration it's been rather rapid but i hope you can see that we are showing similar traditions occurring in yemen we have this interregional um work with foreigners coming into the island and presumably trading with the locals but we still don't know how and what we know what they were trading, but we don't know how or what these relationships were. And that's, uh, again, going to be quite clearly demonstrated with some of the ADNA work we're just about to uh, publish. And again, looking at the belief systems on the island, we know that originally there was a sort of animalistic belief, which at some point Christianity came to the island, and again, Islam came to the island, and this all gets sort of amalgamated and syncretized. And... Okay, so now today, well, we have Islam on the island, where these elements of other religions are there, and one can find them again in the historical record. And finally, of course, work in progress, but uh, we have the defense and control. Now, a defense, you're defending against people coming to the island, you're trying to protect your interest, you're also defending against the Scottish, and this is more what I would call control. One of the forts that we've looked at here is Je uh, Jebel Hawari, which is more defense. Defense against people arriving or defense or early warning. The other fort that we will be uh, doing next year will be looking more interior, and it just sits at a wadi, which will be showing this sort of idea of control, trying to control people coming in and out of the island views. 
and uh, rather in and out of the interior, where they were bringing ghee and other products from the interior to the ships and trying to uh, put some sort of control of taxes. And again, this would go back to a bit of al things. We can go into that later. So um, I suppose I will uh, say so thank you for your attention. And um, if you want to know more about the project, we can see our website, scotoculturalheritage.org. And again, thank you to all my colleagues. I wish they could have been here. Hopefully, uh, they'll be able to attend one of these lectures. I just poor internet connection. And uh, thank you again. Thank you, Stephanie.